it was a strange time coming from a band three mile scream that was so organized and focused i was like who is in charge of cryptopsy i didn't even understand that when i joined the band i was like is it alex that's in charge of this band is it flow i quickly learned it was flow but we didn't even practice for for like months when i joined the band i went into the studio first we didn't, before ever practicing it was just all over the place it was a it was a very very strange time Greetings, friends. Welcome to episode 191 of Into the Necrosphere. This week, I am catching up with Matt Magaichi, the front man for Cryptopsy, the host of the Vox and Hops podcast. And we're talking about As Gamora Burns, the upcoming Cryptopsy record. We're talking about how he ended up joining Cryptopsy, how he dealt with the flak and fire received in the wake of the first record that he appeared on the unspoken king very controversial release uh, and a host of other topics he's a great guy i've wanted to get him on the podcast for a while now and very glad and grateful that i finally was able to do so before we get to that though uh, another episode that i know is hotly anticipated amongst the legion is my in-person conversation with my good friend cheyenne of trivax uh, to get your appetites whetted for that grand occasion, uh, I'm going to play a song off of their upcoming album, LOR Burns Out. This is Trivax with Israel.
The song is Ezreal, the band Trivax, and their upcoming album, Eloa Burns Out, is going to be released by Cult Never Dies on September the 29th. Of course, uh, Cheyenne will be on the podcast next week to talk all about that album and a host of other topics. Um, definitely one of the most fiery episodes I have ever recorded. You are not going to want to miss it. Uh, and of course, if you're new to the podcast, you can ensure that you don't miss any episodes by elbow dropping the subscribe button on your platform of choice following me on social media and then if you truly want to show your love and support for the show you can leave me a five-star review share the episode with a friend foisted on an enemy and head over to the into the necrosphere teespring store and pick yourself out any of the fashion forward yet also grim cult and necro bits of merchandise available there all of the money that I make on there gets plowed straight back into the show. Speaking of which, this show is also part of an elite unit of podcasters known as the Horsemen of the Podcasting Apocalypse. We kick things off every Monday with Horrorwolf 666, hosted by Brandon Legion. Yours truly casts hexes and slaves poses every Tuesday on Into the Necrosphere. Every Wednesday, Sensei Mike Hill brings you Everything Went Black. He returns on a Thursday with the mighty Necromaniacs, alongside his co-hosts Sheriff Mike Scandado and Professor Jeff Kashid. Uh, and then every Sunday, the Reverend Carl Hikara brings you a journey into the dark, the weird, and the arcane with his podcast, Soul Knox, and then intermittently, my good friend Cheyenne brings you his brilliant podcast, Iblis Manifestations. So make sure that you join us in the war against shit content and also make sure that you stick around after my conversation with Matt because there's lots more to come. Uh, we are going to be doing a news rant that almost certainly has to include a conversation about what happened this past weekend at Midgard's Blot with Black Braid. Uh, we also round up a couple of new releases for Judgment. Uh, and then I'm going to be sharing with you my favorite six breakdowns of all time uh, there's another list that was posted on uh, we are the pit and as we know well, those lists always give us license to talk about uh, some really good stuff so that's going to be coming your way very shortly for now sit back and enjoy as i welcome to the podcast for the first time matt mcgachi i did save a can of camden hells especially for this so have you are you familiar with camden hells at all i am not no when you come to the UK again, I, I strongly recommend you check them out. It's it's, it's now I'm thirsty. I, I might have a beer with you. <laughs> it's a, I, I, it, they, I think it's like a, a Pilsner lager is the way that they describe it. Uh, and and the 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 like the Camden Brewery or Cam, Camden Town Brewery is in Camden Town, which I'm, you know I know you've been to. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I I fucking absolutely love it. I've had okay, beers. Well, next time, next time I come over there, we'll go drink beer. This together. is the. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. So, dude, one thing that I realized the other day when I was uh, listening, I was, I was, I have a news rant segment on the podcast, and I, I listen to new music and kind of give my first impressions of what I'm hearing. And I was listening to um, Flayed the Swine, and it suddenly yeah. dawned on me that you are now, technically speaking, not only have you been in cryptopsy for 16 years, which blows my mind. But also, you're the most productive member of, of Cryptopsy if you want to judge it by the number of releases you've been on because you were on uh, The Unspoken King, Cryptopsy. You've been on the two EPs and obviously now on the new record. Does that blow your mind at all, like how, how quickly time seems to have passed? Time, time just goes. It's, 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 um, it feels like it wasn't that long ago, The Unspoken King. A lot of things has happened since then, you know, I grown up. I moved out of my parents' house. I've bought a condo. I've gotten married. I have two kids. We toured the world, hundreds of shows. So, so if you look, I, I tend to appreciate and have learned to appreciate things in life and and every little goal, and then try to like compartmentalize it and appreciate things. It's something that I've been working on for the past few years with the podcast and i think it's just reflected into the band so in the time it just goes it's uh, a lot has happened since the unspoken king a lot has happened since i got that phone call on my birthday in 2007 i was having a party at my parents house and flo said you got the gig so a lot is a lot has happened um i put a lot of work into becoming a better death metal vocalist because i wasn't a death metal vocalist when he first gave me the gig i was some guy that was learning how to scream mainly a clean vocalist that did a little bit of very metal core inspired vocals so a lot has happened time time just goes but it is crazy that it's i'm the longest standing 
Cryptopsy vocalist. Uh, I've been in the band longer than any other vocalist. And even if you put both Lord Worm stints together, I am definitely <laughs> the longest standing new vocalist because I will forever be the new vocalist. And I'm okay with that. I, I was going to ask you, do you still feel like the new guy? When uh, I don't, no, I don't. But I, I understand the, the fans' um, approach to that, where that I am the new vocalist because... Man So Vile is a classic album. People mm. love it. It's it's a it's going to be one of those albums that are in the top tens, death metal albums for the next hundred years for sure. It's just something a perfect storm happened on that record, and we will never be able to not play tracks from it. And I am cool with that. Uh, we played it in its entirety back in 2017, and I fell in love with the album, understanding I guess where the fans are coming from. It's just. It's a perfect album, and the, the band could have rested on the, their laurels and just made another Nun So Vile, and another Nun So Vile, like many, many bands do. They find something mm -hmm. that works, and they just cookie cutter for the next 10 albums of their career and become super successful, but Cryptopsy decided to push the envelope and be different. Uh, and I was uh, one of the things I want to spend a bit of time talking about is the Unspoken King because I have never ever understood the amount of static that that record got. Like, I was a fan of, like, I discovered the band on Blasphemy Made Flesh. Ooh. I was a fan, I loved None So Vile. I was absolutely on board for the DeSalvo era. I loved Whisper Supremacy. I thought, and then your beg was even better. Um, and, I, and I was, you know, I was glad when Lord Worm came back. I remember seeing the band live and meeting Lord Worm for a, a website that I was writing for at the time when Once Was Not came out. Um, but when The Unspoken King came out, I remember hearing it for the first time and it was like, okay, this is very different. But then you, it, it's, it, for me, it was like there was enough familiarity around some of the signature cryptopsy sounds and riff styles that I, I could kind of, get into it and then the the you know there was all this new stuff to discover i thought at the time you were a, just a sensational addition to the band i loved it i i thought it was a, a a new avenue for the band i thought it was it sounded very focused and then i think i had written a review for it it was very positive and it turned out it was like one of the only positive ones at the time i could find it's like everybody's like this is terrible it's metal core it's like what the fuck like are you listening core, to the same core. album i'm listening yeah. to people still call me a death core vocalist i've never I don't know where that comes from, but it was the band was. I joined Cryptopsy as not. I knew who the band was. I wasn't. It's not that rock star Mark Wahlberg story. I wasn't a super big fan. I've become a fan, but it was. Um, they wanted something different. They wanted someone that could sing, sing clean and scream, which is exactly what I was doing with my old band Three Mile Scream, uh, which Chris had produced and then showcased his production to the band, as he always does, as he still does to this day. And Flo was interested. Flo wanted to do something different. And the Cryptopsy never rests on their laurels. And he wanted to have clean vocals. He wanted to do something more musical. The band was not in a perfect um, agreement, I think, of what uh, they wanted the album to be. There was so many different mindsets with Alex writing songs, Eric writing songs, Chris Donaldson writing songs. And it was, you can listen to the record and it's, you can tell that it's all over the place. So you, you say mm. that it's hyper-focused, but I, I do not see that. And I joined the band and it was, it was a strange time coming from a band, Three Mile Scream, that was so organized and focused. I was like, who is in charge of Cryptops? I didn't even understand that when I joined the band. I was like, is it Alex that's in charge of this band? Is it Flo? I quickly learned it was Flo. But we didn't even practice for, for like months when I joined the band. I went into the studio first we didn't, before ever practicing. The one song that was written really as a group, and I think it's the song that really reflects what The Unspoken King could have been had we been hyper-focused the way we were on this track was the last track of the record, Bound Dead. I feel like it's the best example of what Cryptopsy was trying to do in The Unspoken King. So the other tracks, like there's like tracks, Worship Your Demons and um, uh, the Burn one. The, the two tracks that are written by Chris are more of Deathcore E, I guess. I guess that's where people started calling us Deathcore because we released a single for Worship Your Demons. Um, and it was just all over the place. It was a, it was a very, very strange time.
and then we released it. It leaked actually, and then people just fucking hated it. They just destroyed it so mm. brutally on the forums and everything. And thank God it was before social media. Before social media was just like happening. There have been so many memes yeah. about us. And then I think the real thing that went wrong with the Unspoken King is how we reacted to the fans by making fun of the trolls, of the haters, um, with our intro, the dinner time Johnny intro, which we thought at the time was very funny, which is, you know, I, now with maturity looking at it, I see that it was like a, a very bad move to, mm -hmm. to mock your fan base because they don't like your music. Albeit some people were very negative and very vulgarly attacking us. And I think that a lot of it had to do with they finally had Lauren Worm back and they got Once Was Not and they were happy and then he's gone and then here they are in a completely different direction and then they're mocking us. It was a, a real slap in the face that so we shouldn't have we shouldn't have done that. It was funny though. <laughs> it's, it's we, tough it was though, funny. We, we laughed a little bit on Summer Slaughter doing that, but uh, it, it's definitely not the right move yeah, coming yeah. from a politic, let's say, respecting your fans. Sorry. When you're a young man, though, and you're you're full of piss and vinegar, and you know these these things that are being said about you online become so intensely personal so quickly. Oh yeah, they were like. I mean, it, it, it would be. I hope you're. I was about to say it would be hard to died. resist the. It, it, it's yeah. hard to resist the temptation to to lash out that way, right? Mm -hmm. But what we we oh, yeah, if I like could go back in time and change one thing about that whole thing, I wouldn't change the record, but I would mm. change. I would not do the it's dinner time, Johnny. Um, yeah, we made a shirt for it too, which is also was just not nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it, as I said, for me, I, I I was just from the get go, I was on board with it. I remember, I think the first single that came out was "Silence the Tyrants," which I loved. And then I I remember hearing, listening to the record end to end, and it it was an album that made much more sense to me if you listen to it from start to finish. Like mm. it wasn't something that you could just listen to in chunks. But I remember hearing um, the plagued for the first time, which is I think it's the plagued where you, those clean vocals are like, really, that, that was actually the really song, prominent. That was the song that I try. It was like the tryout. You had to they had singers come in and record with Chris that track, and that's basically what's on the record is my tryout. I don't think I recorded, re-recorded. I think we just kept it the way it was. So mm. I was going to ask. That was so very, you, very clean. Yeah, lots you, of you mentioned that. not being a uh, you know not not having been like a you know a, a diehard you know full blooded Cryptopsy fan prior. How did the conversation start about you joining the band? It was uh, just Flo. We had played. Flo came to some show because Chris was in another band, and Flo came to the show, and he, I remember him. I knew who he was. Like. We're, I'm from Montreal. Everyone knows. I know who Cryptopsy is. I remember I knew that they were a famous band, that they were super. I knew who Flo was. And he was like a little inebriated. And he was like, you make me think. You make me think. And then this was like in March. And then I got a phone call from him about a month and a half later asking if I wanted to join. Uh, because he, I, Chris had recorded my band, so he he knew of me and my vocal skills because Chris was showcasing the newest Three Mile Scream. And I said no. I was like, no, I'm not going to try out or join the band. I'm not interested. I want to make it with Three Mile. I feel like we're close. And he respected that. And then the leader of Three Mile quit. And as soon as I hung up the phone with the leader of Three Mile that quit, and I picked the phone back up and I called Flo, and I'm like, "Are you still looking for someone?" And he was like, "Yes." And that was that's where it rolled. Hmm. Were you uh, were you surprised to get the call, or were you, were you surprised? Oh, I was super, it? super, super surprised to get the call, yeah. and then I was super surprised that I got the gig too. It was uh, you never know, right? It's a you never know. There was a, there was a bunch of people trying out for the band at that time that are more extreme vocalists, but they wanted something different. And if it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? Mm. Where does that vocal style come from? Because like, you know, if you listen to, to that song, we've just mentioned in particular, like, like it's a, I mean, you have a very, very powerful singing voice. And, and I, I, I've, you know, having been around this music now for the better part of, I mean, we're coming on forty years now that I've been that I've been into this music, and now you you meet various people, and you start to realize that particularly a clean singing voice 
um, it's not just in everybody's wheelhouse to do that. Like it's a, it, it, it takes an awful lot of work. And, and like you, if you hear a Warrell Dane, and I remember speaking to him and asking whether he ever had voice lessons. He's like, no, I just I was always sing like this. I just practice a lot. And that, that that blew my mind. But like you, like I've I've met people like Kane Gressel, for example, from the Amenta, and you know he he like really studies the song craft of singing. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's a uh, yeah. I'm I'm curious about how your your singing style evolved over the years and kind of where you got that from, where that started. Sure, I I always wanted to be a vocalist. I always imagined being a vocalist. I remember going on a family trip and listening to Bohemian Rhapsody. And like imagining myself come out as Freddie starts singing there. Uh, I always sang. There's videos of me very young singing, clean vocals, of course. And then in high school, I started a band, as people do, a new metal inspired band, of course. We covered Deftones and stuff like that. And my aunt wanted to protect my voice and she got me voice lessons. So I started taking singing lessons with this elderly French lady here in um outside of montreal where i grew up and i just kept singing and singing and singing and i'm definitely highly inspired by like brandon boyd on science um incubus um tool was a big one really resonated with me and then i fell into mike Patton. and then once you start listening to mike Patton, there's so many avenues to go down and that's when i started screaming more was with, mm. with, with Mike Patton and experimenting with my voice. And right at that exact same time is when I joined Three Mile Scream. And the, the, the early Three Mile Scream stuff was very Mike Patton worship. Um, and then when I tried out for Cryptopsy, I was, I remember writing the plagued and, and like, I had to find a hook in this music, this, this very dissonant music. And I tried a bunch of things and then finally I hit what what ended up on the record but uh, i've always wanted to sing mm. and now i'm singing a lot less and i'm screaming a lot more <laughs> i was about to say i mean things have things have certainly changed a bit but mike Patton is somebody who i'm also a fucking enormous fan of like when i when i think about people that i i, I joke with my girlfriend because my girlfriend doesn't listen to music i listen to whatsoever so we'll be in the car and we'll listen to stuff and i've, I've always said to her there's three people that if i could if I could have a a wish that I could sound like one of these people when I sing, like it wouldn't be like some death growler or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of guys that do death metal vocals that I think fantastic, but if I could sing like th like like one of the following three, I'd be I'd be happy. Mike Patton, Josh Homme, Mark Lanigan. Nice. Those to me yeah. are three of the most emotive and three of the most versatile singers. Glenn Danzig maybe as well, but like Glenn Danzig, I almost revere so much that I I wouldn't I wouldn't want. <laughs> want to sound like that there should really only be one glenn danzig but yeah mike patton josh army mark lanigan but M mike patton where did your what was your first encounter with him uh what did it i think it was mr bungle because i have a friend vince that i'm still friends with to this day uh in high school that he was the music um conductor conduit the one that would find these bands he like found slipknot on the first release there and like we got the cd and then we went to the show like the week later it's one of those weird happenstances uh he i always whatever he recommends or whatever he would get into i would sort of fall in suit and um it was mr bungle it was uh, the first album from mr bungle i think i actually got the second one first but it was so weird uh disco volante that i ended up going backwards it was the time of napster so I started mm. like downloading like a bunch of stuff and I, and then it was faith no more second, but it was like, a, I had like a faith no more like mix CD of like all the albums and made no sense. It wasn't like done by album. It was just all mixed up. Um, cause I downloaded them. I was about to say the, the, the Napster days was a, was, was a heady time. Cause you would kind of, if you liked a band and you, you know, you were only downloading by song. So you had to do all the sorting and all the stuff yourself. Exactly. Like, and I remember many, uh, many a day spent like changing the ID three tags and all <laughs> yeah. that, you know, all that bullshit. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you were too busy for that, then. Yeah. But Patton, say, yeah you, Pat, Patton was just a, and once, once you're in, it's like, there's so much to, yeah. To dig through and, and to analyze and, he does so much with his voice. And then Phantomus was another one that I got into with the weirdness of it. Just like, it was like almost comical, but I liked it. There was something going on there. And uh, it's, it was just one thing after another. And then 
Tomahawk was another big one. I really enjoyed that. Mm. Just loved it. Loved it. And I've only seen him live once with, um, what was the one second, two seconds, three seconds, five seconds. Ago. I only saw him live once with that project. I can't remember what it's called, Peeping Tom. Um, and I've never seen him with Faith No More. And I've never seen him with Mr. Bungle. Oh, and dude. Faith No More, it's because every time they come to Montreal, I'm on tour and it's happening mm. again in September, Mr. Bungle's coming and I'm on tour, which, and Vince is like, I have a ticket for us. <laughs> and I was like, I'm on tour. <laughs> God damn it. Now, I, I, I was about to say, I was going to ask you whether you've seen him live. It's it's an experience. I've seen him live with Tom uh, Tomahawk twice. I've seen Faith No More twice. Um, and there's always something different. He's he's a guy who can just fuck around, and he he sounds incredible. Absolutely. Like if you if you've seen them on the there's there's tons of clips of this floating around. But if you watch some of the the first shows they did after they reunited and they would do it, he was like introing uh, Chinese arithmetic by singing Poker Face. Yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, and there's exactly. uh, a couple of Tomahawk shows where he was doing a cover of uh, Portishead's Glory Box, and it was yeah. just. It's a fucking unreal. It's like the guy can interpret any other person's music and just make it completely his own. Exactly. And that yeah, to me like is that. again that that is a that is true mastery of your mm -hmm. craft at work. The um, Dillinger Escape Plan uh, with Pat oh, was yeah, another big yeah, one. Yeah. That that might have been one of the first two. I think I was like, oh my god, what the fuck is this? Yeah, mm. yeah. That 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 Dillinger Escape Plan EP. Especially with him singing, I mean, it 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 is like a waking nightmare when you listen to it. Like I, I remember hearing the album for the first time. I was listening to it on headphones, and it's I mean, it's it's over in like twenty minutes, but it's yeah. it's just the most frenetic, insane fucking thing you've ever heard in your entire life. And he does again; he does more voice on the four songs on that EP than most, most people, people do. do for an entire career. Exactly, he's a he's, a, he's amazing. Yeah. So you're like like so so your your kind of I, I think vocal heroes vocal inspirations uh, outside of Mike Patton any anyone in particular that that kind of springs to mind or that you that you particularly um, admire digging into like the death voice there that's George obviously he's the master he's so so good and such a cool guy uh, touring with him picking his brain and he's just like I just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, you thought you were going to learn loads. <laughs> it's like, okay, how do you do this, George? I, I remember it. sitting with him on the bus one night, and he was like, no, I, I, I just, you know, he pulls his shirt, like, I just do it. <laughs> uh, Travis Ryan, obviously. Yeah. One of the best, one of the masters out there. Um, that That's it, really. Just And then Lord Worm, because I had to do his parts for so long and i feel like i'm finally understanding what the hell is going on lyrically and like i would like approach the songs when i joined the band and i was like what the fuck is he saying he's not saying this i remember writing the guys and be like he doesn't say this but now when i listen to it i'm like oh he does say this it's like something unlocked in me recently mm -hmm. and i'm like oh i gotta learn this song again but actually do this because now i get it like when we learned to um, none so vile and full orgiastic is the last song of the album so it was the last song i learned and now like listening to it i'm like i learned it wrong and i have to go and read program my brain to to fit i'm like he totally says this how did i not hear this six years ago you know <laughs> but you have a if i can give you one compliment you have a real knack for i mean i mentioned your clean vocals but if we're talking about death metal vocals you have a real knack for rhythm uh, and it's something that I'm a, a particularly big fan of. I know you guys, you you did that um, guest spot for Werewolves on uh, oh, I yeah. Hate Therefore I Am. I love them. Phenomenal example to me yeah. because I, I'm a huge fan of Sam Bean and I'm, you know, somebody I consider a, a, a friend as well. But like the, the the interplay between you two and when you start with a, you know, I've waited years for the for the burning to come, you know, it's just, it, it's so hard. The thing with, 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 um, with death metal vocals is I, I sometimes think some people underestimate how much more effective your voice can sound if you if you have that command, that that groove, that rhythm in your voice. Because you can you can I think weaponize your voice is, is maybe the best word to to use, but you can weaponize it so much more effectively. Like you go back to all of the, you know, all of the legends like David Vincent, like at his absolute best. Um, you know, or, or Glenn Benton at his absolute best, Corpse Grinder at his absolute best. The stuff you remember is where he's hitting this crazy rhythm with his voice. Sure. 
um you know and it and it, and the voice almost becomes a hook like i i've, I've often said it, it's a little bit like hip-hop in a way like old totally. school hip-hop where the the voice was very much the hook totally i've been i've been working very hard on that honestly and chris has been pushing me because uh when he when he was recording me three mile scream i my screaming when i would sing clean my timing was perfect but then when i would scream i was so focused on pushing and getting the sound that i would fuck up the timing all the time and it's something that we've been working on a lot especially on the new record as Gamora burns and uh, chris definitely like pushed me to 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 hit the rhythms it's it's probably my most musical approach mm. to to songwriting and it's really it's chris is doing and it's something that like i feel like he's unlocked uh, something in my brain because now when i do think about composing new stuff i really do feel the grooves better and i do agree that that the most memorable parts are when the the groove is there and the rhythms are are hitting all the right musical aspects and that's something that i'm still aspiring to do more of and Chris is, is a musical genius, so I'm just I, I'm his puppet. I follow him. <laughs> so what? Out of, out of interest, so what? Without giving away your your secrets, what are some of the, the 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 things that you've done? You know, when you say you've worked on on getting that rhythm down, what are some of the things you've done to actually improve or to I've actually kind of analyze part of what you're doing? Other music, actually, and like realizing that verses, a lot of verses start like on an upbeat, and then have this sort of like rhythmic flow to it and then choruses will have more of like a starting on the one is something that and, and like listening to music and and counting and understanding what is working here why is this working is something that it's like it's like a something that i do mentally and approach trying to decipher what the hell is going on in music now and it's something that i've brought now when i'm playing the tracks these new tracks i find myself almost dancing mm -hmm. which i can't do on stage but <laughs> 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 yeah we'll see how that goes but it's just so much goddamn fun it's so much more fun and i i feel it too when i'm like learning we're doing back to the worms to honor ungentle exhumation on the tour coming up and i feel it in that song too i'm like everything makes sense now everything is more musical oh. if i just uh, find the, the grooves and the rhythms i got the promo for the album about probably I'd say two weeks ago, and I would definitely agree with you in terms of the rhythm. It feels like a much more rhythmically orientated album, and totally. what I love about it is, um, it, it it creates like a sense of dynamics that I think has it's not necessarily lacked from Cryptopsy, but it just adds an extra dimension to the band. Um, and totally, there's been like all if I doing, yeah. yeah, and if I if I go back to like my favorite Cryptopsy songs ever, like you know if I think so, Silence the Tyrants would definitely be on that list. If I go to Let's take a, a you know let's, let's let's take something completely wacky like and then you'll beg. Um, I'm trying to remember what the song is. My uh, voice of unreason. Oh, yeah. There's a part where um, uh, you know where, where Mike DeSalvo goes like something like yeah the voice of unreason, but it's like like pom 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 pom. It's like real aggressive like you know hardcore testosterone badassness. He, but he, it just takes that song like, and it just everything. elevates it yeah, above yeah. everything else. He was there A to Z from what I've heard there. They they would jam to yeah. write music back in the day. That's how John and Flo wrote, and Mike was there the whole time, and he would just understand the music, which is very important because it was very complex, and Mike has an excellent sense of rhythm. Um, a lot changed. We don't write in a jam room anymore. We write in the studio. That's how Chris likes to write, and Chris is writing the music, so that's what Flo has had to come to terms with. It was a, a problem about five years ago and him wanting to jam Chris being like this doesn't work i'm not productive in this state and f but they've worked through it and it's it's for the best and having chris just be such a musical genius and understanding the the every aspects of the riffs and the songs it's so helpful and he really just destroyed everything that i had pre prodded and and rewrote everything basically with me to to make it be far more musical and uh it works and i'm i'm, I'm excited to keep doing that i'm excited to for more people to hear the rest of the record because we've only mm -hmm. dropped two singles so far and uh it continues throughout the record it's it's like a whole new version of me going out there into the world and i'm excited for more people to hear it
Yeah, and that's hundred percent what I was driving at. It's like there's definitely an added dimension to the band. I really liked the the self titled record. I fucking loved the two EPs. Um, I mean, I think especially the, uh, the 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 first EP, the opening track after that. You know, the, yeah. you're about to hear the sounds of hell, and then it's fucking you know all over the place. I thought that was awesome, but it, it's it's great that you guys have kind of done something that. I think pushes the sound forward a little bit, but still retains some of the core there. But one of the things that I was um, I was curious about uh, is the the road that the band have traveled from a business perspective. I mean, you guys did the Unspoken King on Century Media, and then you, for a period of time, you were you were operating completely independently. You did the Correct. EPs yeah. on Kickstarter or GoFundMe. Uh, Cryptopsy was that done through Kickstarter or anything? Any of those uh, no, platforms? Cryptopsy we just did on our own. Uh, the the self titled the uh, we with my wife's help actually she did a bunch of research for us, and uh, she found Bandcamp. We like did CD Baby, released the record by ourselves, and it was a huge success. It really worked super well because the Facebook uh, we were able to connect to our fans on Facebook that back then because the algorithm hadn't become so complex and monetarily driven at that point. So we would put a post on Facebook and all 350,000 fans would see it. Mm -hmm. So it went super well. That was a, it was a huge success. It was a eye opening for the band that we could just connect directly to our fans without having any label uh, between us. And we also realized that it was a lot of work and a lot of that mm -hmm. work sort of fell on me <laughs> to do a lot of social media stuff and to, to get the album up and to run the website and all that stuff that the label was doing before. And then there was many discussions over the, the 10 years that we were independent, uh, late night beer fueled arguments about wanting to get back on a label because we felt that we weren't being seen, especially as the monetarily driven um, algorithm stepped up on Facebook where we dropped the two tomes and we felt like nobody saw it. There's some times that we go play and they're, they're like, I've done interviews for the album coming out and they're like, you've done nothing in 10 years. I'm like, no, we did stuff. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> we were busy, but <laughs> I haven't just Well, that was, a, that was an interesting thing. I, I, I've read some, uh, some articles and some reviews of it recently. I think even Blabbermouth, when they, when they posted about the record, they were like, and I mentioned this on the, on the, on the podcast, they're like, oh yeah, they've got a new uh, album out, their first material and, and, 10 years or 13 years or whatever. I'm like, no. No, we basically they, they, they put out stuff. Two, four track EPs that basically would have been another full length album had we put it out like that. The, the, we did the Kickstarter that was my idea, heavily inspired by Obituary coming back and they just, it was so successful. There was like, we were like, oh, we can like fund everything and like up mm. our stage production and get these EPs out and pay for everything. Uh, that was super stressful. I, I probably one of the most stressful periods of my life trying to get some eyes on this Kickstarter, and it didn't work. And we we did not succeed, <laughs> which which happens, right? You know. Then there's like there's that band. I can't remember some European band that made all that money and then never fulfilled um, what they were promising. They never released the album or something. So we did release the EPs, um, <laughs> but it was it was tough. And then but we're happy to be back. On a label personally i'm very happy uh, mm -hmm. i feel like a lot more people are seeing that there's new material coming out i think that this album deserved a higher platform and there was only like a handful of labels that we would have worked with and nuclear blast was at the top of that list so when when i hung out with charles from abysmal dawn who works at nuclear blast on in 2019 and he was like i think i'm gonna, think I'm gonna offer these guys something and i was like oh yeah let's do this and then the next day he wrote me, he was like, I was serious. And I was like, oh good, no, so were we. So, and it mm -hmm. took a long time for it to all come together. It took a long time for us to finish the record. And then here we are. So you, you mentioned, uh, you know, just, just backtracking a little bit, you mentioned there that, you know, there, there were a lot of things that led to Kickstarter not being successful. What, what do you think, what were some of those factors? Can you expand on that? I don't know why it didn't work. Um, I think fans were more, comfortable coming to shows and supporting us there because mm. while we were doing that we were on tour it was a huge success the tour we were getting a bunch of merch uh, support and selling great um why did it work i don't know i i is it is it 
was the algorithm already hitting at that point where we people weren't seeing it hypothetically um other bands had huge success you know like protest the hero was another one that inspired me to to do a, a kickstarter because i think they did like like four hundred thousand dollars or something it's like we just wanted 20 or something just to to mm -hmm. pay for the studio pay for chris uh, you know chris is doing his own band but you know he's still not working when he's doing work for us so we have to pay him and uh, artwork and we really wanted to like we're still at this point we want to up our live stage game is something that we're hoping to do over the next year um bringing up a, a more visual part to the show is something that we're aspiring towards well, those strippers cost money to have stage, so. <laughs> um yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was just pondering it as you as you as you were talking about it. I can't figure out why it wouldn't have worked either. I mean, the. I think the there's definitely something in how people consume music and art nowadays. I think unfortunately they've been conditioned into getting their music for free. So, and because they've been conditioned into getting their music for free, I think there's a direct correlation in the way that they the amount of value they attach to um, to music. Which is which I, I would also as a side note say is why I see the the response it shows being so much more muted uh, relative to how they were like when I first moved to the UK, for example, I remember seeing Slayer in two thousand and three and I mean it was fucking it was carnage. You, you were lucky to escape with your life. Uh, and then I saw Slayer on their last ever show at Wembley Stadium. Chilled. People were standing, a couple bit of head banging, bit of marshing, nothing, nothing crazy. I mean, it was like People would have like for you know for Slayer in uh, twenty years prior that would have been a slow night. So um, I, I I definitely feel like because the physical act of handing cash over to get a CD doesn't exist anymore, I think that's changed the dynamic and the relationship. You you can play a great show and the and people who see you go that's fucking great. I you know they 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 immediately inspired and motivated to go buy a piece of merch because they want to represent what they just saw or just inspired them. But I think I definitely think that there's there's something to that dynamic that is that has changed quite significantly, which is maybe what makes something like Kickstarter difficult. And hypothetically, hypothetically, we hadn't um, proven to our fan base that we were back. You know, mm -hmm. hypothetically, we did the the, the self titled was a great success, a return to form, as as some people would say. But but hypothetically, we hadn't connected with our fan base properly again um the, the the relationship of cryptopsy and the fans over the years is is a very uh strange unique unique relationship there's there's people that love those early albums and then people that didn't like the switch to mike DeSalvo, and then lord worm comes back and the people that liked the mike DeSalvo era were disappointed that lord worm was back and then i came in so cryptopsy has had like a tumultuous relationship with their fans mm. One thing that everyone, everyone didn't like me, so that was good. Those unified. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you how, <laughs> like, how how did that impact you personally? Because you're a 24 year old man. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we I'm 43 years old now. I know what I was like when I was 24. That sort of thing would have fucked would have pissed me off. Now I, I don't think it would bother me at all. But it, it it's I I can't imagine it wouldn't have have at the very least gnawed at your your confidence to a degree. Like like how are you how so are you much. experiencing all of that? So much. It took many 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 years to to feel comfortable and have confidence in myself that I'm doing a good job. Uh, I think like the turning point of me actually like being on stage and enjoying myself was Maryland Death Fest 2017 when we did none so vile and it went we, we had a pop it just it was an amazing show uh i think that was it's such a key festival for the genre for for the fans um the culture of extreme music and i think that was finally the moment but there was many i was i remember that first european tour i was sheepish it's my first tour ever you know just sheepish Going through the the, the motions, um, terrified basically on stage, just <laughs> hoping that I'm doing a good enough job all the time. And then mm -hmm. we did Summer Slaughter. It was it was stacked that that lineup with you know Dahlia, Cataclysm, the Faceless, Despised Icon, Born of Osiris, um, White Chapel was fucking opening, just just stacked. And I was 
I didn't feel like I should be there. And it took me so long. And what changed was I put the work in. I became a better death metal vocalist. And I even up till 2019, when I started doing a new whole new vocal technique of just doing false chords all the time, which is something I stumbled upon during Tome 2. I was just walking back into the vocal booth and I was just, I did some false chord scream and Chris was like, what's that? What's that voice? He's like, you should do, do that voice for the next part. And I did that. And there's some sections on Sire of Sin where I, there's a, I'm using false chord. And then that became my Lord Worm voice. So anytime we toured after that, I would just use that. But I remember being on stage the first night of that aborted tour hell over Europe in 2019 and I was doing it and I was like, this is working, this is good. But I had, I had to like mentally prepare myself because I, it's a different technique, right? So, so I was on mm -hmm. stage like saying, oh no, don't do that, do that. And I had to like figure it out like on stage because we don't jam enough. And, <laughs> but it worked, it worked. And I, it's like this voice that never goes away uh, my fry if i don't scream for a few months getting back into fry vocal shape takes time as opposed to my false chord it just it's like my voice it's the voice mm -hmm. i used to use in three mile scream which is funny enough and then when i got into cryptopsy i wanted to be so brutal so i tried going screaming deeper and deeper which worked against me but it took me mm -hmm. a long time but I, and i'm finally you know that none so vile album run really helped and then discovering the false chord open screaming and now i'm prepping for the tour and i'm only doing that voice so even on the the book of suffering stuff we're doing i'm doing a whole new vocal approach and i'm so comfortable and confident that i'm just having fun it's, it's i'm finally having fun <laughs> mm. it's a it's such a it's such a I, I guess a conundrum to be in because people respond to like audiences respond to confidence. Like there's no doubt about it. Yes. Like, you know, you, 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 I was from, faking it. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, and then you, when you, when you know you're faking it, you become very self-aware. Mm -hmm. And then when you become self-aware, it's this, this loop that this mm -hmm. doom loop that you're in was like, okay, they're going to, you know, they're going to sense that I'm think, faking they, it. And then figure like, it out. That impacts your performance. Um, yeah, so it's, did, did, like, did you ever get to a point where you were ready to kind of hang it up and say, like, I, I just no, no, I, I love it so much that that it's it's that connection with the fans is so amazing, and I've always wanted to sing, so mm -hmm. here I am doing it finally, and everyone hates me. <laughs> they they didn't, but you know, this is what's in my mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it took so long, but no, no, I never wanted to quit, no. And the band was always so supportive. Uh, Flo specifically loved me. Like he's mm -hmm. like, I don't fucking care what anyone's saying. It's like you're killing it. You're doing such a good job. And I've interviewed so many people, and I always like do jokes with people that that people didn't like me, and they're always like, Matt, you were amazing, you know. So who knows what's going on? It's, oh, a, it's, a, it. it's a it's a mental thing, right? You got to get over stuff. And I put so much into the band and so much sacrifice. Now I have kids. And I'm gonna go away from them. I should have fun. <laughs> it's not just about making an earning or I, I should enjoy this experience because not everyone gets the chance to do this. And it's something that I'm trying to appreciate a lot. And having the pandemic come in and I guess let's say take it away from us is is, is caused me to appreciate it even more. Mm -hmm. The how, out of interest, how old are your kids? Uh, seven and five. How do they, what do they think of dad's music? They, they like it. They, they don't, my, my, I was practicing vocals um, two, three weeks ago, just going through the set, just with like Bluetooth headphones in. And my son was playing drums and my daughter was on the trampoline just screaming. And then I had a phone call from my friend uh -huh. after like a 45 minute set. I'm kind of talking to my friend, Mike, who's my rep at Audio Technica. And he goes, uh, the, my, my son is just, he's screaming the whole time. <laughs> and I, he loves like deep death metal growls. He loves it. And I was like, I can't tell him to stop because I've just been screaming in his face for 45 minutes. Uh, they get it. Uh, how much are they going to like it for real when I'm 
gone as much as I'm going to be gone in the coming year. That's to be seen. They were young when I toured before. So are they going to, you know, lucky technology is amazing and we can still communicate, but I'm sure there's going to be some shitty days. And mm. How long are you going to be away for? About five weeks. Let's say four and a half weeks coming up in September for the Carnival of Death tour. And then we have Asia coming up uh, in December, right before Christmas. So. But you'll be home for Christmas. I'll be home for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. No, because I yeah I can I can only imagine, especially when they're that young. My my daughter is nine years old now. My I'm separated from her mother, and uh, I mean even the the you know because I, I get her every second weekend. Those those times that you have to say goodbye to her, that's that's rough. That's really, really like rough. even now like I'm so happy like I'm like we organize stuff right you know like oh we're gonna go out we're gonna go on a date and I put my kids we organize they go to the parents Jessica's parents and my parents, and I'm so excited like when we're planning this, but the moment they're gone. Mm. I miss them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see how you know. I I remember being on tour and missing a birthday, you know, moments like that, and then ends up being a shitty show. You know, like mm. <laughs> yeah, because you feel guilty. Bit, you, yeah. you you feel guilty, and you feel you would feel guilty enjoying yourself as well, mm -hmm. because ultimately you're a you're a good dad. So we try to be. So um, we'll see how it goes. Um, um I want to have fun. Though. That's the the, the main thing. I want to connect with a bunch of people that I connected with through the podcast and I want to reconnect with, with fans and friends that I've had on the road, uh, crew members. I can't wait to get back into Europe, uh, to hang out with my sound man, the American King mega who I haven't seen since 2019. So very excited to on that aspects of things. Mm. Are you going to be able to carry on the podcast while you're, uh, totally. while you're on the road? I, I'm totally, I did it before. It was the original way that the podcast started. So just face to face. I just won't have the video part of it, but I just started uploading to YouTube just the episodes that I had. And then mm -hmm. pandemic hit and I was like doing it on Zoom. So I was like, I'll just upload this video, brand it and upload it. Uh, but it's a, the, the audio side of the podcast is what works there more than the YouTube. So I'm just going to keep going. I'm right now. I'm working very hard to um, stack all my episodes so that when I'm on the road, they just come out. Mm. And um, while I'm on the road, I'll record like a whole bunch more, like I used to. Basically, yeah. like, the touring package and friends that come through breweries because uh, I hit up all the breweries that I've worked with over the years. Uh, they're going to come out, and we're going to enjoy some beers, and I'll record episodes with them. Um, no, the podcast is, um, I like during the pandemic, I like really leaned heavily into the podcast because the band was writing and quiet, but now I've like shifted my hustle, hyper hustle focus that I had on the podcast towards the band. Cause I think it's, it's time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm on break this month, which is great for the podcast. I've organized, uh, scheduled breaks where I do like seasons you can call them i don't call them seasons but i do three months on one month off and it just cycles like that and it gives me um time to recharge and recoup and just you know getting away from the whole publicist game and i'm sorry if publicists are listening to this i just want to talk to people i want to talk to I, it's yeah it's so much it's how the podcast started it, it's it's what works best for me I've met some amazing people through publicists, but it's it's too much of a hustle game having to hit some marks, which is just annoying when I don't even listen to the promos. It's like, I just want to talk to the people. Mm. So, so um, yeah, no, the podcast is definitely still running. It's, it's doing well. Um, it runs itself basically at this point. I've done it for so long that. I was about to say, when did you start? In 2018. So I'm. October 2018 is when I launched with 10 episodes that I had recorded over the summer. Yeah. And I've just never stopped just releasing content over 400 episodes at this point. Just, I think 462 when I, when I counted loss, I was like, that's I think four, I, I'm, three, I think is what's released. And I have about 10 in the bank that I'm okay, okay. editing at the moment. Cause I'm, 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 I'm about to come into episode 200, but I started oh, in September, 2019. Amazing. So I'm yeah. about, I'm about a year away from, yeah about a year away from you, but I I'm with you on the question around publicists. I've met some fantastic publicists, like people that I genuinely like and think are, are great. But I, a, a big part for me of doing this was one, I said, I'll, I'm never going to try and make a cent from this ever. 
I, mm-hmm. you know, I sell merch, but any anything that I make out of that, it gets plowed into the camera, the microphone, totally. and, you know, yeah. all that shit. So it's I, I don't want to make a cent from it. I've got a job. I don't want this to be, be become a job. And I never ever want to be in a position where I'm obligated to speak to anybody who I don't want to speak to, review anything I don't want to re- talk re- review or talk about. It has to just entirely be about what I like, music I like, and then I use it as a platform to push bands that I I enjoy that maybe people don't know very much about. So so Werewolves is a good example of a band that I've, wow. I've known Matt for for quite a while. So when when the first album came out, I, I pushed it relentlessly on the podcast. And I hope over the years I've been able to help move the needle for that band a bit, as, as, as I hope I've done for other bands too. And that's kind of the main goal. Can I, you know, moving the needle for bands that I believe in and that I really like and, you know, meeting people like you who, you know, who I admire, whose music I think is fantastic and, you know, who I think I can have a good conversation with. But absolutely, it can't be about, it can't be about uh, like serving a publicist or serving any agenda other than my own. I, I completely agree. It's, and it's, I've done both sides of it. Just the podcast at, at first was like, really, I would go to a show. I would take a friend, we'd go to a bar and we'd have a chat and then I'd walk them back to the venue. And then I'd be like, okay, it's your turn now. And I would like record like four or five episodes with a touring package. And then I would have content because I, I, I don't know if you're like this, but I, I have a, a fear that I'm going to run out of content. But it never happens, right? It never yeah. happens because there's always another conversation you can have. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's moments where I'm like, oh, I got to do it all, you know? I got to, and then with the publicist, it's like, oh, well, you get this opportunity. Oh, you can talk to George. You want to talk to George? It's like, of course, I want to talk to George. Oh, but uh, then here's the here's the the grid. You know, choose your time, and you get 30 minutes with George. And I'm like, that's that's I don't like that. It's it's mm. I don't like feeling. And if you've ever spoken to George, it's, you, you can't control him. <laughs> he's not going to talk for 30 minutes. He's going to talk for an hour and a half and he's going to, yeah. you're, you're going to steal someone else's slot afterwards. So, so just friends, um, connections. It's something that kept me busy because I knew I'd be jealous of my bandmates who were so, so busy in 2018. Ollie was joining cattle. Chris's studio was rolling at 120%. And then Flo got, David Vincent as his vocal vocalist for Ultimas. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh shit, what am I gonna do? <laughs> podcast. And the podcast Ultimas has given me a... so many gifts. So many, so many gifts. Yeah. So, uh, so, such as out of interest sake? Oh, like I've leveled up myself in mm. the past five years. I I'm better. I can do Photoshop. I can do some video editing. I can manage like big projects like the beer collabs that I've launched there when 2021, when I released 24 beers in a week where I made collabs for alumni um, pairing bands with metal breweries across North America. That was like, I had a week vacation and I spent it sitting here just doing social media. It was horrible. Never doing that again, (laughs) never doing it again. Uh, So that, you know, and like organizational skills, um, conversational skills, confidence when just speaking to strangers um it i've like leveled myself up in the past five years and it's something that uh, i think the band needed someone to come in and, and have more like on top of it it's like staying on top of stuff i'm very good at like micromanaging mm-hmm. stuff which is something that the band needed so those collabs that you do, are, are you involved in like tasting? You know, do they, are they, no, no, I, they're, they're experts. I let them, so there's yeah. some that I've like earlier on that I was more like, I want to be exactly like this. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, especially with my massive global one that I'm doing this year, Pit Culture, which is presented by Metal Injection, and uh, all the hops are given by Yakima Chief Hops. Um, that is really like, I created like an idea and I was like, you guys do whatever you want. Mm. <laughs> just just send me a picture of the beer when it's ready and I, i'm gonna promote it on that side so so i at, at first i was like really really heavily involved especially in the ones in montreal because i would go and actually brew the beers mm. like my um i did a smoothie sour with brewski which is a very cool brewery here in montreal and that from a to z like we came up with what the beer was going to be and i brewed it with them but at this point they're like man you're going to come to brew today and i'm like i'm not going to come to brew today i don't have time to take a day off work to go and drink beer with you and I'll come when it's ready and I'll, <laughs> I'll take it home and drink it on the podcast. Mm. 
Yeah, I, 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 I think I had um, who was it? I think it was Aaron from My Dying Bride who was, talk- yes. was talking about their uh, yeah. their beer that they. He was did. very involved. Yeah. I was about to say they were he like very, from very step one. They were going yeah. in, tasting, exactly. comparing. They actually hit um, me up to get it it brewed in the states, and I failed at making it happen. I introduced them to a few people, and it just never panned out. Sadly. Yeah, I, I I I like beer, but I'm I'm I am more partial to red wine. I think if I, if if in some, you know, bizarre world I ever did a an into the necrosphere wine, <laughs> it would definitely be a red wine Very of cool. some sort. I would go. I mean, I I I could seek out a brewery in so on a brewery a distillery in cool. South Africa, and uh, and get it done there. Like I where where I where I grew up, there's an unbelievable amount of just elite of the elite level wines. Amazing. So, um, you know, so if you, if you like, 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 like high, uh, like Sam is the same high, high end red wine. Can't cannot more strongly recommend you pay a visit to South Africa. They like their beer as well, but wine is what they, what they're best at. Amazing. Sam, Sam can't drink beer. If I remember correctly, he has a, a gluten intolerance. Oh yeah. I don't even think he's mentioned that to me before, but I know he's got a very, he's got a very, you know, very uh, decent wine collection. So I did say to him when uh, when I eventually come and visit Australia, we're we're for sure going to be exploring that a little bit. Nice. So <laughs> no, I, so, I, I love making collabs. It's 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 fun. Um, I'm lucky with breweries because it's uh, such a uh, an industry that that they have to release new things because it's just the way the industry is. And for me to come with like a whole idea, a whole like template of a label that they just have to finish some things on Photoshop, they're very happy. And I give them a bunch of free hops because I got Yakima Chief hops involved there. So mm. they're very happy to always do collabs with me, but you have to know the right people. Yeah, yeah. So final question for you. At the age of 40, you know, I, again, I'm 43 now, so I, I know the I know that the transition you make at that age when you, uh, how you start to think about life and what the priorities become in life. What is kind of the the next frontier or something particular that you want to conquer in the next couple of years that, that you haven't done yet. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, it's, it's funny that I'm going through a whole transition right now and it's like happenstance that it's my 40th birthday is um, I'm an early childhood educator, right? So I've been doing that for 15, 16, as, as long as the band basically, like I graduated and then I joined Cryptopsy and I started working in childcare at the same time. Um, so now with all the tours coming up, I have them actually t- stepping back away from uh, working in a daycare full time. I'm going to be working partially when I'm at home. Um, I'm going to be staying home with my kids because we homeschooled them. So, so that is coming up. That's something that we're going to be, it's this whole transition thing that's happening in my life. So, so that's definitely, I, we, we choose to spend a lot of time with our children because we think it's important. And that's something that I'm looking forward to because I did a year sabbatical when my daughter was 18 months uh, into her second year. And that's when like the podcast was born. So, so a lot of positive things happened that year. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen with this year around the touring. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, sir, thank you so much for your time. I am very excited about what people are going to say about uh, As Gamora Burns. I think it's a fantastic album. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, like I said, for what it's worth, you know, back when everybody was hating on you, uh, <laughs> you had a you had a fan right here in London. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I can't wait to come back. Uh, we're working on something. I can't talk about anything there, but we're in the new year, we're going to go. We can go drink a beer at that brewery. Hell yeah. That sounds like a good idea to me. All right, my brother. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.
a blistering track to cap off a really fun conversation with Matt. Uh, that was Flayed the Swine by Cryptopsy of their forthcoming record as Gamora Burns. It will be out on September the 8th through Nuclear Blast. A big thanks and a shout out to Claire over at Nuclear Blast for uh, getting this conversation set up for me. Uh, and a massive thank you to Matt for his time. Hopefully that will not be the final time that he appears on Into the Necrosphere. Uh, and I can tell you guys right now that new Cryptopsy record absolutely crushes. Um, yes, I know that uh, I am in the minority when it comes to my love of the Unspoken King, but um, if you liked the self-titled Cryptopsy record, if you liked the EPs, uh, believe you me, you have uh, much to be excited about when it comes to this new one. Right now, my friends, if you believe that uh, CNN and Don Lemon is the antidote to misinformation, it's time for you to get to step in because this is my weekly news rant. A roundabout for judgment. And hang them where the world can see. So we may as well get the uh, unpleasantries out of the way at the very start of the news rant. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Black Braid and what happened this weekend at uh, Midgard's Blot. Now, um, if I were a superstitious man, uh, then I might be tempted to observe that whenever I get a high profile guest on the podcast, they somehow seem to find their way to uh, controversy very shortly after appearing on the show. Uh, John Krieger of Black Braid is definitely not quite uh, the same or doesn't enjoy the same public profile as Dave Ellison of Megadeth. Um, and uh, he also fortunately doesn't share Dave Ellison's enthusiasm for public masturbation. Um, but he did get himself into a spot of bother at this weekend's Midgard's Blot Festival over in Norway. Um, as you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, Metal Sucks report, Black Braid say they were racially targeted last weekend when they were ejected from Midgard's Blot. Um, a slightly misleading headline because there was a, uh, a walking back uh, and certainly a toning down of the rhetoric. But um, without reading this nonsense, uh, the gist of what happened basically uh, is that members of Black Braid were removed from festival grounds by security. Uh, security cited excessive intoxication as the reason for doing so. Uh, and then John from Black Braid very angrily took to Instagram shortly after this exchange. Uh, he alleged that racism on the part of the the festival organizers was to blame um, for he and his bandmates' removal, um, and unsurprisingly, it completely and utterly blew up online. Uh, a few hours later, uh, he went back on Instagram, and this time, uh, seemingly cooler heads and a steady, very professional hand prevailed, um, and uh, the uh, racism claim was replaced with a formal apology by John. Uh, he stated, amongst other things, that he and his band uh, should have behaved more responsibly. So that's kind of the, the you know, cut and thrust of what happened, as they say. A few things I will say about this. Number one. Uh, the man I had on this podcast a couple of episodes ago uh, seemed to me like a reasonable gentleman, uh, and I greatly enjoyed my conversation with John, um, as did most of you, judging by the response that I had on uh, on the socials, uh, you know, judging by the comments on, uh, you know, the YouTube video, etc. Um, what John and his band did, in my view, was very disrespectful, completely wrong. Um, but also to impugn an entire festival as racist just made the situation significantly worse. If this was a, um, a scenario where maybe one security guy is acting in a fashion that's a little sketchy, uh, then call out the individual. But don't try, especially not in this environment, to uh, make it seem as though the entire festival is to blame for the actions of one man. Uh, now, that being said... Uh, the, the level of outrage that I'm seeing uh, about all of this, I don't personally feel is commensurate with a band's misdeeds. Um, you know, from my perspective, and we've spoken about it often on the, on the news rant, you can cast your mind back to the heyday of Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Pantera. I mean, you name the band. And there is a very, very good chance that you could probably look up reasonably easily 
at least five or six major bust ups that they had with security. Uh, it happened. No one, you know, really seemed to kind of batter an eyelid about it. It used to just be baked into the cake. Nowadays, we seem to take real offense to it. Um, you know, myself and Matt spoke earlier about how much we enjoyed uh, the music and the work of Mike Patton. Mike Patton peed on a security guard's head uh, at the London Astoria at a Phantomos show. Uh, I believe it was either Phantomos or Tomahawk back in 2002. Most people still think of him as a hero. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, John is young. I don't necessarily think he is used to this level of attention. Um, he did apologize, and I'm personally willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, if I could give him any advice, and I do know that from time to time he actually does listen to the podcast, it would be this. Own your actions, learn from this experience, and move on. People have got short memories. They'll respect you if you hold yourself publicly accountable. Um, and they will respect you even more if you um, seek to live by your, your promises, live by your words, and you know not, not fuck around like this again. Um, you can also, on the other hand, give in to the misgivings of the many naysayers that you have online, and you can see how well that works out for you. I mean, the reality is there's probably just as many people that are rooting for Black Braid to fail as what there are folks that are uh, you know wanting for them or wanting them to succeed. Um, you know, and uh, he's, he's, you know, I would say to John, you're best off not giving them any ammunition. Um, and this incident certainly didn't help, but I think he knows that. So that's my take on uh, the whole Black Braid saga. As I said, fortunately, he didn't, uh, you know, didn't show videos of himself jacking it on uh, on Zoom. But um, I am concerned now. Any uh, any future high profile guests, if you come on into the Necrosphere, watch out. Right, we make our way to metalstorm.net. The first headline, Blutaus Nord streaming their upcoming record in its entirety. I actually got sent the promo for this by Debra Mamorti a couple of um, couple of days ago. But uh, I mean, I already said the, the podcast was late. And by the way, thank you so much to everybody who checked in to see whether I was okay. I was absolutely fine. I had my daughter here over the weekend um, and we were just really, really busy. I just never got around to actually putting the, you know, three, four hours of time aside that I need to record the intros, the outros, all of that sort of malarkey. So all coup de la my, on my end. I was also too busy to listen to uh, the Blue House Nord promo, but I will. That last single that we checked out, I thought was excellent and I thought definitely hinted at a fantastic record. So uh, I will check it out and I'll tell you guys exactly what I think um, in the uh, in an episode upcoming. I'll probably do another review roundup actually, um, at some, maybe on next week's episode. Um, there's a few albums I want to talk about. Um, you know, a couple that have, I may have mentioned previously, but I've only really now gotten the time to uh, properly check out including on uh and then the new unblessed divine record is out so there's a lot of stuff to uh to to discuss uh next up we've got nocturnus ad who welcome a new basis and have finished recording their new album it says here nocturnus ad are very pleased to introduce kyle sokol as their new bass player additionally tech death metal unit from florida confirmed that they've completed the recording process of their sophomore album the latter will be mixed and mastered by jared pritchard at new constellation studio uh i was not the biggest fan of that last uh nocturnus ad record paradox uh, i am a very big fan of nocturnus um, and I would actually say that uh, one of the records that was in strong contention for inclusion on my uh, top six uh, when I did the 666 90s death metal countdown with the Mike's Scandado and Hill uh, is actually Threshold by Nocturnus. And if you want a, a reason why that would have been, then I urge you to go and check out the, uh, the track, uh, I believe it's called Arctic Crypt. Uh, really, really good stuff. I mean, the whole album from start to finish is, is excellent as far as I'm concerned. Like, you know, perfect old school death metal, but they were also using keyboards and things like that in a way that many other bands weren't doing. I felt that some of that excitement just wasn't there on Paradox, but that being said, um, it says here a statement from the band. It's been a while since we posted anything, but we've been quite busy. First, we want to welcome Kyle Sokol, our new bass player. He has just joined the band last weekend, and he's amazing. Oh, he is an amazing bass player and will definitely be a great addition to our band. Second, we finished recording uh, all of our next album uh, on Profound Law Records, and we will be mixing and mastering it with Jared Pritchard, blah, blah, blah. The album will be a continuation from The Key and Paradox. Again, the last four songs will continue the key story of Dr. Magus. Um, so, yeah. I'll uh, I'll wait and see what the uh, what the new album's like. Um, 
you know, am I optimistic about it? Maybe, maybe. Um, a lot of you certainly seem to enjoy that uh, that Nocturnus record. I think the average score on um, Metal Archive for um, for Paradox is eighty eight percent, so not bad at all. All right, time to time for us to listen to some music. So here's a track that we can give a spin to. Uh, Desecracy have uh, premiered a new song called Approaching Sound. It says, yeah, as part of their next full-length effort, uh, Deserted Realms, Finnish death metal purveyors Desecracy have launched a brand new title track entitled Approaching Sound. No idea what Desecracy sounds like, but uh, we're about to find out. So things I like, I think that intro is really cool. I think it sets a really nice tone, really good atmosphere. Uh, the riffing I think is excellent. I really like that dive bomb that the guitar is doing. The I think that sounds very, very cool as part of the riff. Uh, I think it, it, it enhances and it elevates it really nicely. Um, not so sold on the vocals. I mean, they like Will Raymer levels of deep. Um, but I, they're a little nondescript for my taste. Uh, I think you guys are starting to get a, a picture of the sort of, um, or the kind of vocal style that I enjoy. And, you know, this one is, it's not bad, but uh, it, it could be better. Put it that way. It wouldn't put me off it entirely. I mean, it's not like the, the, the Cartman band that we listened to the other day. But uh, it's, uh, like I said, it, I think, I personally think it could be a little bit better. But anyways, let's, uh, let's get back to it, friends. I think that guitar work especially the soloing is really really cool there's almost a bit of a hint of greg mcintosh in there um which i'm also not mad at uh and i was looking it up while we were listening to that song desecracy is a what seems like a one-man project i would assume it's one dude and then you know maybe he has a session drummer or something um uh, he has been going since 2009 and he's been a busy boy this i think is the eighth album that he has put out uh, the last one he did was Unveil in the Abyss, which came out uh, last year. So uh, he's a prolific character. And uh, like I said, there's enough here to make me want to check out the album when it is released. Uh, when is it released? Oh, I just say uh, it's part of their next full-length effort. Um, release date. Ah, I can confirm off-screen that it is September the 26th. 
Moving on, um, Monument of Misanthropy have uh, dropped a new track. It says here, yeah, brutal death metal band Monument of Misanthropy have uh, released a new single from their upcoming full-length Vile Postmortem Irumatio. Um, the Devil's Slide is available for streaming as an official guitar playthrough. This looks a little like one of those slam worldwide bands, so I'm, I'm cautious of these because many of them are not good. But uh, let's give it a listen. I don't think this is meant to be a music video. I certainly hope it's not because it would be one of the worst music videos ever. It, it's kind of like a, a playthrough video and uh, the person is getting bored while the dude is playing and he's messing around with his phone or whatever he's recording it on. Um, the song itself, though, not bad. So zero for the video, but probably a seven, seven and a half for the song. Uh, you know, some of the typical uh, deathcore tropes, but uh, um, actually overall, I think it's pretty good. Uh, I think the melodies are quite catchy. I think the song is, you know, brutal, intense, aggressive. Uh, production's pretty good. Um, so uh, not bad so far. that part i can fuck with no doubt about it that that is that is absolutely up my street and we're going to be talking in a little bit about some of my favorite breakdowns um so uh brace yourselves for that brujeria launch a video for bruja uh encabronada track uh like me some brujeria as you will know bruja encabronada is the second single from brujeria's soon to be released new album esto es brujeria uh, and it has premiered online in the form of an official video music uh, sorry performance footage by Roll Verture uh, and Emmerich I'm not even going to bother trying to pronounce his uh, surname it sounds quite frankly like some sort of in demonic incantation so uh, let's get on to the song <laughs> Contra abusadores, por las desaparecidas, cubierta en sangre, llorando y gritando, lloran, 
That woman sounds like she works uh, security at a political rally in Juarez, uh, and I like it. I think I think the song is great. Um, I mean, you know, they're not going to win prizes for being the most um, uh, the most musically innovative band around, but they are a lot of fun, as far as I'm concerned. And I've said this before; I'll stress it again. If you get to see them live, don't miss it because they are fucking excellent. Like so, so entertaining live. Um, and they've got what now appears to be four vocalists that uh, that stalk the stage. And you know, you you know, how I feel about multiple vocalists. You can, you can never lose with multiple vocalists, as far as I'm concerned. Right, I think that's about enough. We're, we're almost at the very end of the song, but uh, yeah, cool, cool stuff there. You're not gonna, you know, if you're not a Brujeria fan, you probably just skip past the uh, the two minutes or the three minutes that we spend listening to that song. But uh, if you are, yeah, you, you know, you know what you're letting yourself in for. And uh, just to add to my comment around around liking multiple vocalists, I I, I like the kind of chaos and the unpredictability that it um, that it brings. Uh, there's nothing cooler to me than when I'm watching a band live. And uh, they bring on a uh, guest vocalist or two guest vocalists and, you know, rip through a cover of a song or, you know, do a song together. Like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. If you go on YouTube, you can see Biohazard doing um, Hold My Own with Scott Vogel from Terror. Um, and they've got one other person on stage with them as well, I believe. And it's just it's such a cool version of the song. Uh, another band, you know, we, we've we touched on them a couple of times on the podcast, uh, Despised Icon. They have two vocalists, and just that dynamic on stage, I just think is great. Um, you know, it feels it feels like something spontaneous could happen, and I, I, I really enjoy that, especially when I watch bands live. I don't really want to see perfection live. Uh, I want to see spontaneity. I want to see something that feels like I was, I like, I, it makes me feel fortunate that I was there to see it, if you guys understand what I mean. Uh, okay, right. Let's uh, let's move on. Um, and uh, oh, next up, Satyricon working on new material. Uh, Satyricon frontman Sigurd von Graven, aka Satyr, has checked in with a statement that the work on the band's next full-length installment is in full swing. It's planned for a spring-summer 2024 release. More info in due time. Um, and uh, Ikorus, uh, a uh, forum member over at Metal Storm, writes, Why the fuck is he wearing a Back the Blue Oakley t-shirt? Is Satyr a cop-loving bootlicker? That's not very black metal. Um, I mean, I, you guys know my thoughts on uh, supporting the police. I think... Uh, I think you are more than welcome to rail against the police when you yourself have served, um, let's just say five, five straight shifts in a difficult neighborhood. Then you're more than welcome to say that, you know, they're, they're trash, they should do their job differently, etc. Um, and I don't want to go off on a tangent on this because we've spoken about it in the podcast before. But I, you know, as much as there are some police that certainly deserve a, uh, deserve their comeuppance. I mean, we recently saw the incident um, here in the UK of uh, no less than seven police who stormed a home in Leeds and wanted to arrest the girl, uh, a 16-year-old autistic girl, for daring to comment that uh, one of the police women looked as though she were a lesbian. Uh, a lesbian like her grandmother. Her grandmother apparently is a lesbian. She's married to a woman. So uh, cops like that, throw the book at them. 
but um, you know, to to as a general rule, you know, have you know, just a, a, just generally despise cops without at the very least thinking about the level of stress that those poor folks are under uh, when they work. That's not right. That's not that's not something I can back. Um, they, there was, it was really interesting. They did this thing on, uh, I can't remember what news channel it was, but um, shortly after the George Floyd incident, they, they took a reporter through a couple of scenario tests and they were like, okay, you know, you come out of a, a building and there's a guy busy breaking into a car. How do you respond? And I think within, uh, within like 20 minutes, he had failed four times where either he himself would have gotten killed if this were real life or he would have killed the assailant. So it's a tough job. Um, anyway, that that being aside, I just 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 wanted to just wanted to throw some balance into the conversation as far as law enforcement is concerned. Um, there is no balance to be had when it comes to Satyricon. If they make anything remotely as terrible as Deep Calleth Upon Deep, I may well just have a blanket boycott of that band on this podcast altogether. I you know again, I was one of the guys that actually liked Volcano. I liked Now Diabolical. I even liked the self-titled record. I think there's some great songs on it. You know, and this is from somebody who discovered them on the Shadow Throne, you know, and I've very swiftly got Nemesis Davina, and I also got, um, uh, what's him, Dark Medieval Times. Love those records, and I always will love them, and I've always been on board with different things that the band want to do. But Deep Calleth Upon Deep is a load of fucking absolute sweaty bollocks. Okay, uh, a band who do not produce sweaty bollocks and potentially wouldn't be able to even if they themselves were at the time suffering from sweaty bollocks is the Amenta. Uh, and they are releasing a new EP in October. Uh, Australians, the Amenta, announced the release of a new EP, Plague of Locusts, the 10-piece music effort comprised of eight covers, intro and one new track, uh, was mixed by the band's very own Eric Mees and mastered by Mayor Applebaum. It'll be released through Deborah Mamorty Productions on October the 19th, 2023. Below, you can check out a video clip directed and edited by Robert Brenz for the title track. Uh, I am going to say nothing more and just give you guys a, a little taste. <laughs> everybody is what you call a fucking masterpiece <laughs> that is fantastic now i am somewhat biased revelator was my favorite album of 2021 their debut ocasus i spoke about this uh, a while back it was my my favorite record of 2004 and probably my favorite record of 2008 was uh, their album non uh, and i also absolutely adored flesh's air which they brought out in 2013 this band's really never put a foot wrong as far as i'm concerned and this song is no different every man year is at the absolute top of their game uh, from Dave Haley through to uh, Kane Cressall, who is just a phenomenal vocalist and front man. And uh, I mean, bassist, guitarist, Tim Pope on uh, keyboards. He's a top don as well. And this is just fucking fantastic. If you like it, the Amenta, you, you are in ecstasy right now. Uh, and it seems like they're doing some really interesting uh, covers. So there are covers here of Diamanda Gallus. Uh, they do Asteroid by Killing Joke. I would have preferred War Dance, personally. 
Um, but uh, be that as it may, Angry Chair by Alison Chains, a very uh, daring cover, I think, to do, but I think a good choice all the same. Uh, Wolf Eyes, Lord Chaos, Halo, Nazgul, and My Dying Bride. And again, My Dying Bride, interesting choice, but I mean, there's almost certainly very palpable influences um, uh, of My Dying Bride in their music, so not not surprised. But uh, this song being the, the new or the, the, the original song, if it's an indication of what they're going to be doing on their next album, then you can count me absolutely fucking over the moon and say this is an early contender for my favorite album of the year in which it'll be released so let's get back to it Absolutely top notch, no question about it. Any 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 other uh, opinion is wrong, and you're wrong to have it. If uh, if indeed that is what you hold. Um, okay, Marduk reveal video for Shovel Beats Scepter. We listened to that song last week. No need to listen to it again. It is brilliant. Um, so uh, you know, spoiler alert if you haven't checked it out yet. Uh, and once again, a reminder that album is fucking fantastic. Ministry are putting out their 16th studio album in March of 2024. It says here, Industrial Metal Veterans Ministry are ready to unleash their 16th full-length effort uh, titled Hopium for the Masses. It's slated uh, for release on March 1st, 2024 via Nuclear Blast Records. It's comprised of nine new songs. You can check out a music video for the first streaming single, Goddamn White Trash, featuring a guest performance by Pepper Keenan below. Um... I spoke a couple of weeks, perhaps even last week, about uh, Ministry because we were listening to the new Prong single. Uh, I had some uh, rather scathing words reserved for Ministry. We're going to listen to the song first, uh, and who knows? I mean, maybe this is the uh, this is the moment where Al Jorgensen makes one of the most spectacular comebacks in all of music. Somehow, I doubt it, but we're about to find out. We need your help. Go, 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 go. Talking, of course, about extremism and extremist ideology. PPP views and conduct. PPP views and conduct run counter to everything which can actually tear at the fabric of who we are as an institution. The institution. The institution. The institution. We need your help. 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 We need your help. tragic how a man who built a career on questioning the orthodoxy of his time has devolved into the milk toast shill that is Al Jorgensen in 2023. And this, by the way, is coming from somebody who quite, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say recently, but certainly a good 20 years ago, I entertained the notion of actually getting the band's logo tattooed on my leg. That's how big of a fan I was. Now, there's probably a lesson here 
in never ever tattooing the you know logo of any band on you but you know that's that's a uh, a different topic of conversation the fact remains that whether it was a mind is a terrible thing to taste psalm 69 filth pig or al's myriad side projects all of which i love revolting cocks lord uh you know this used to be a man that re rebelled against commonly held paradigms regardless of which side of the political spectrum they landed on nowadays when you skim across the song titles of basically any release he attaches his name to you're basically reading the talking points of the average rachel maddow episode we've got yeah bde goddamn white trash just stop oil <laughs> Aryan embarrassment and then tv song uh sixth edition whatever the fuck um uh what's the name new religion it's not pretty cult of suffering ricky's hand um you know it would be one thing if the triteness of his message was counterbalanced by music that retained even a shred of the menace and the danger and the unpredictability that he was able to muster seemingly at will as a young man um, but the boring, predictable pile of fucking crap that we just listened to proves that unfortunately that is not and potentially never ever will be the case again. If you think about where it all went wrong for Al, you, you come to the realization that uh, the most provocative, interesting, thought-provoking, challenging music and lyrics that this guy wrote, he did while he was so deeply um, ensnared in drug addiction, so hopelessly ensnared in drug addiction that he probably doesn't remember most of his trips to the studio. So, uh, you know, those old records, um, again, whether they be Lard, whether they be, you know, the classic Ministry records, whether they be, um, you know, classic uh, Revolting Cox, I'll always love them. It'll never, ever change. But, um, yeah, it's it's been... Uh, it, 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 I've taken this one a little harder than than I've taken other, you know, s superstars or, or su other, sorry, not superstars, childhood heroes that have fallen from grace. Uh, you know, Metallica, that was a tough pill to swallow. You know, I was I was all in for Master of Puppets and Justice for All. Like, I, I grew up on that stuff. It was, that was my favorite music when I was a, of a certain age. Same deal with Slayer. Um, you know, and I've I've seen them devolve into just mediocre nonsense. I mean, Slayer called it a day, Metallica's last record. I personally think... The lot more I've reflected on it, it's the worst thing they've ever put out. There's, there's, I, I would sooner listen to St. Anger than listen to the new Metallica record. Um, and then, as I said, Ministry just to me was always something a little different. It was something a bit unique. And I'd, I'd always hoped that it would retain something, just something exciting and unpredictable. And I was even, there, there were moments, bright moments on that Bush trilogy. But good God, beyond that. This dude has literally gone out of his way to just make absolute trash. And the the worst thing, the 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 the, the crowning achievement of his slide into uh, woke mediocrity was shilling for the vaccine uh, not so many moons ago. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to keep on talking about this. Uh, it just saddens and depresses me. Let's see if we can find something else that uh, is uh, going to cheer us up. Torture Squad, uh, Brazilian death thrash metalers Torture Squad debut Hell is Coming, the second single from their upcoming album Devilish, said to be released on September the 22nd, 2023. Comment from the band Hell is Coming is a progressive death metal piece inspired by the online game Diablo 4, where Lilith is the main character. Uh, in the main, sorry, in the music video, Lilith is played by the five times world champion in cosplay and drag queen Marisho Somenrazi, aka Slovakia. I think you guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe you can read my mind. Um, if you are listening to this, perhaps you can guess from the inflection of my voice. Based on that description, I'm thinking to myself, this ha th this music had better be fucking good.
you know, it actually started off pretty good, and then um, this this bit that we've gone into right now just doesn't really do it for me. It feels very, very... There's something about it that just feels very sterile. And they had that cool rhythm uh, right at the beginning of the song. Uh, I don't think the production's bad. There's just, I don't know, there's just something that feels very paint-by-numbers. Let me, let me give them one compliment, though. This, is, this shit's way better than the last creator. Um, but then again, you know taking a, uh, a knife and sticking it into my kneecap is better than listening to the last creator record um, but I'm uh, I'm gonna give them another 60 seconds so let's hear where the song goes from here No, I'm afraid. I mean, that's it's not bad, but it's it's nothing nothing to get excited about. I think the music video has got quite a nice aesthetic. Um, the rest of it, eh, not really doing it for me. Okay, let's do two more, uh, and then we'll uh, go check out some breakdowns over on um, uh, We Are the Pit. Hex Vessel drop a new song. You guys know I've been flipping out about these Hex Vessel tracks that they've been released, uh, being released, been releasing. I, uh, the song is called A Cabin in Montana. The glacial third single from Hex Vessel's forthcoming Polar Veil vale album is out now and available in the form of an official music video. Vintage footage taken from the Canadian adventurer Tommy Tompkins' wildlife films uh, of the 1970s. I have loved those first two songs. Um, it has made me extremely excited about the, uh, the new album, so let's hear what this one sounds like. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm letting this one run on a little longer than I normally do these songs, but fuck, that's so good. It's it's so interesting and so unique. I hear hints of candle mass in there. I hear hints of like Americana. Uh, I hear, you know, quite a distinct vein of black metal running through it. Um, again, I think I might have mentioned this uh, previously. There, there's something about them that reminds me quite a bit of uh, Crippled Black Phoenix. Um, maybe even Johnny the Boy to a degree. Obviously not as heavy as Johnny the Boy. But, um, you know, this, this, uh, they certainly have something in common with the, uh, the crippled Black Phoenix gang. Um, but uh, from my perspective, I mean, it is just top notch. Um, you know, like, like I said, unique, different to everything else that you hear. Um, and uh, I cannot wait for, um, for this record to come out. I'll tell you what else I can't wait for, the extinction of all flies. Because as you can see while I'm recording this, there's a fly bugging the ever-living fuck out of me. 
Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's get back to it. Yeah, no, great stuff, absolutely fantastic, um, and uh, like I said, can't wait for the rest of uh, of this record, and I am definitely going to see if I can get them on the podcast. I actually worked out the other day, there's only about 16 more episodes left until uh, I take my uh, my leave of you all for uh, the remainder of uh, 2023. So the last episode by my calculation is uh, December the 5th. Uh, then I'll be headed off to the motherland uh, for four glorious weeks uh, where we, we will be going on safari, generally chilling out and having a good time, eating a lot of steak and drinking a lot of wine. Uh, that, of course, is unless uh, the uh, deadly new uh, COVID variant doesn't uh, upend everything. I saw that um, they are desperate to try and uh, to try and play that little um, beaten down tune in the news recently. Um, something I posted on my personal um, Instagram the other day. Uh, on the 1st of August, there was an article saying that uh, Pfizer is considering making staff cuts because of a drop in demand for COVID products. And then, wouldn't you believe it, on the 16th of August, there's a headline also in Reuters where uh, the Biden administration is urging you all to get your COVID boosters. And then today, uh, August the 22nd, we learn of a deadly new uh, variant to the disease that apparently is ravaging the land. So uh, it's, 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 I can't imagine those things have anything in common. That's all I'm going to say. I can't. I mean, it, it must be real. Okay, we're going to finish off with a new track by Primordial. Um, the, this one's been a, a while coming. It says here, September the 29th, 2023 has uh, been set as the official release date of the new studio album from Irish Legends Primordial, entitled How It Ends. It was tracked at Hellfire Studios on the outskirts of Dublin, produced by the band and engineered by previous collaborator Chris Fielding. In advance of the record's release, the band unleashes their first single and album closer, Victory Has 1,000 Fathers, Defeat Is an Orphan, and its accompanying video. Let's hear what it sounds like. <laughs> There's something about the that line, the hunter becomes the hunter, the way that Alan sings it, that reminds me a little bit of Warrell Dane. And I mean that as a great compliment because I love this song. Uh, I love this song and I think that there is an extremely good chance that Alan is going to find himself mentioned in the uh, hallowed uh, 2003 top 30 of 2023 
uh, uh, on Into the Necrosphere, not once but twice, because Verminous Serpent, uh, The Malign Covenant, that album is almost certainly going to be on the list. Uh, and if uh, the rest of the new Primordial album is anything like this, uh, it is also going to find its way onto the list. I have always felt like Primordial uh, ages like a fine wine. My favorite Primordial album um, is Exile Amongst the Ruins, which I know is uh, not the most popular choice. Uh, you know, The Gathering Wilderness, A Journey's End, uh, Spirit, The Earth, The Flame, and To the Nameless Dead, they all have their, their bands, and I love those records too. But uh, there's something about Exile Amongst the Ruins. I don't, I don't know what in particular it is. But lyrically, musically, just it speaks to me more so than any other Primordial record. I think it's phenomenal. Um, and I feel like this is almost a, a follow-up to that. I mean, it is directly a follow-up to it. But spiritually, there def definitely feels to be a connection here, which I, which I really like. Um, I also like the fact that um, I, I, I enjoy the way Alan presents lyrics in a way that, you know, it's he definitely has a very clear intent with what he's writing but it's also open-ended enough for you to be able to interpret it and for those wondering by the way um i am working on getting alan back on the show we've exchanged messages um also fun fact and in case you are new to the podcast we actually did try and hook up a face-to-face uh, when I was in Dublin uh, in March of this year, but they were actually recording the Primordial album at the time, so he had vocal sessions and stuff to go and do. But I'm hoping it's going to be able to happen. It's been long overdue. His last appearance on the podcast was like episode 87 or something. That was a blast. I've been on his show as well. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, hopefully we're going to be able to make that happen. In the meantime, we know there's an absolutely fucking phenomenal record on its way. top-notch emotional beautiful lush production uh i think alan sounds in absolutely top form just it, it, there's nothing that is out of place for me in those first three minutes and eight seconds so over on we are the pit uh the article reads the 10 sickest breakdowns of all time now we know of course that uh, in all likelihood these breakdowns are not going to be sick uh, nor certainly the best breakdowns of all time but uh, let's read what they have to say uh, it says here over the years heavy metal has evolved giving birth to various unique techniques and styles that have captivated audiences around the world one such technique the breakdown has undoubtedly stood out and established itself as an integral part of the genre's identity when we delve into the realm of heavy metal it's almost impossible to overlook the power and significance of breakdowns they're not just confined to one subgenre from the pulsating rhythms of metalcore and the intensity of deathcore to the fast-paced beats of thrash and the rhythmic tempos of groove metal breakdowns find their rightful place Today, we're deep diving into the heart of this phenomenon, blah, blah, blah. These are our 10 sickest breakdowns. Uh, and they start off on a almost unacceptably bad foot uh, with Lorna Shaw, To the Hellfire. Um, you all know my thoughts on Lorna Shaw, one of the worst bands in the history of the universe. So we're not going to bother talking about that. Next up, they do redeem themselves somewhat. Uh, they have got Domination by Pantera. Now, when I give you my list in just a second, um, we don't have Pantera on there, but I will say I did strongly debate including the end sequence of the song Slaughtered or Far Beyond Driven by Pantera in my list, because whilst that's not strictly a breakdown, it, it sort of kind of fits the definition. 
I also think it's a lot better than the song domination, and it, I mean, it's probably one of the uh, the finest Pantera moments ever. I, I I genuinely actually think the the magic of Pantera sits in the kind of breakdown bridge, I would call it, that they put into a lot of songs, you know, where there's like a breakdown and a bridge happening at exactly the same time. Good example of that is is Slaughtered, um, you know, but there's a bunch of other songs as well that uh, I'm sure you can think of if you're a fan of the band. If you're not, uh, well, you, you probably just went, oh, fuck him. How can he still listen to Pantera? Blah, blah, full Anselmo, white supremacist. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we move on. Uh, Davidian by Machine Head. Uh, they say, yeah, thrashy and ridiculously heavy is what you'll get from Machine Head's Davidian. Uh, on the first song of the band's debut album, they were absolutely not messing around one bit, for Davidian is a wicked ride of groove metal chaos. Great album, that first uh, Machine Head record. Uh, I love the second album. After that, of course, uh, it is a slide straight into the bargain bin. Uh, after that, we've got Apostle by Reign Supreme. I've always felt that Reign Supreme are uh, reasonably meh. Seven Stitches by Disembodied. They've got their next, The Saddest Day by Converge. Not a not a bad uh, breakdown. I absolutely adore Converge. Not sure I would have put it on my list. Then we've got Tactical Nuke by The Acacia Strain. Um, I think it's a good song, but I do believe that The Acacia Strain's Finest Hour, I've said this a couple of uh, episodes ago, is a track called The Mouth of the River. Absolute genius. It has another of those breakdown bridges. Um, but if you haven't listened to that song, then do yourself a favor and check it out. Then we've got Entombment of a Machine by Job for a Cowboy. Another, you know, selection that's not bad. Um, does it get my, uh, my pulse pounding? Probably not. Tower of Snakes by 18 Vision. Absolutely fucking rubbish. Uh, and then Raining Blood by Slayer. Uh, I love the song, love the album. Uh, I think that choice is, um, it's also a bit dull. So, here's the definitive list of the sickest, of the truly sickest breakdowns, and I'm going to give you six. So, uh, so let's, let, let's call it six of the best. <laughs> For those that uh, grew up in a certain generation and uh, knows what it's like to uh, visit the uh, the principal's office uh, and he uh, takes old hickory out of the cupboard. Anyways, uh, first up, we've got off the brilliant album Pierced From Within, Suffocation with Suspended in Tribulation. This one tends to kind of hit out of nowhere. Uh, it comes early on in the song, about a minute in. But goddamn, when it lands, especially with that uh, growl that Frank Mullen throws in at the uh, sort of, or, or to sort of announce the breakdown, it is just absolute fucking genius, as you're about to hear right now. Next up, we have got uh, Terror with Pain Into Power, the song off the album of the same name. It's, of course, their most uh, recent album. Most people that listen to Terror will probably be able to name at least six or seven of their favorite breakdowns just combing through the Terror back catalog. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, in the background, the uh, dog and the cat are uh, seemingly uh, engaged in a bit of a mosh pit of their own. Although the cat's now had enough and she's jumped on the windowsill. Anyway, uh, I, I love most of Terra's songs, love most of Terra's records, um, even though I still hold them accountable for the fact that uh, this last album was not really an album. It was very much a glorified EP, but it is sensational all the same. And the song, Pain Into Power, when it kicks in with its breakdown, it is just pure fucking barbaric, knuckle-dragging malevolence. You turn your pain into power To get all these kicks and make these towers No matter what they say, no matter what they do Up next, we've got Pyrexia with We Are Many. Uh, 
I think when it comes to the Pyrexia discography, there are at least four to five contenders for this list on every single Pyrexia album. And I also know that there are uh, a number of members of the Legion who would probably have demanded that I be drawn and courted if I left Pyrexia off the list altogether. So I've had to include them here. My favorite Pyrexia song is probably taken off my favorite Pyrexia album. Uh, that is We Are Many. Uh, it's off 2021's Gravitas uh, Maximus. I think part of the reason I love this album so much is because it just completely and utterly caught me by surprise. It was released in December uh, and um, it did come with a lot of fanfare, but I remember listening to it and just thinking it's the, one of the most crushingly heavy things that I've ever heard in my entire life, punctuated by the breakdown you're about to hear, which I will also say features two of uh, the most incredible bonus elements that you can imagine when it comes to breakdowns, a bass drop and an exorcist sample. Next up, we've got Internal Bleeding with Focus. Uh, this drop, uh, or this breakdown, uh, hits us at about the 2 minute 24 uh, mark. Now, what certified nerd squads like Lorna Shaw and Chelsea Grin have yet to learn about the art of the breakdown, I think Internal Bleeding have long forgotten. Like Pyrexia, the entire Internal Bleeding back catalogue is literally filled with masterclasses in the art of breakdown savagery. Uh, but in my opinion, they really took things to a level that very, very few can even dare to emulate uh, on the song Focus. This is both crushing and life affirming. All right, next up we have probably the choice or the selection on this list that stretches my interpretation of the term breakdown the furthest. But if a breakdown is defined as that point in the song where the rhythm drops to about half step, and the music awakens a primal urge in you to wreck everything in sight, then this is almost certainly one of the best examples I have ever heard in my life. And I will also say I've per personally witnessed such riotous behavior when the band play the song that uh, I think only Biohazard can come close to comparing. Uh, the song is Retina, the band is Despised Icon, and this is pure balls out celebration of testosterone. And then finally, a band not well known for breakdowns, uh, but I'm going to make a case for why this is one of the very best breakdowns of all time. Akrakoka, the song is called Becoming the Adversary. It's taken off of their masterpiece, Corinzen. I said this to a couple of members of the band when they were on the podcast. I think that this needs to be 
Acrococcus, um, Angel of Death, or Seek and Destroy. This this is it. This this is the Acrococcus signature song. One of my favorite Acrococcus songs, and it ends off with something that is just absolutely extraordinary, which you are about to hear right now. And there you have it, friends, my six favorite breakdowns in all of music, a list vastly superior to any other that you will see on the Internet. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the news rant because it is wrapped up for this week. And sadly, I also wrap up this episode. Next week, I'm back with my good friend Cheyenne. I will be back to my usual uh, Tuesday drop. Once again, apologies. I know many of your Tuesdays were ruined, and uh, I heard from people that they had taken to drink. They were walking around in their streets crying, saying, where's Jackie? We can't, can't cope without an episode of Into the Necrosphere. Tuesday uh, next week, you will see me and Cheyenne at the uh, Derbyshire Country Club talking about black metal. <laughs> and uh, there'll be a host of other exciting things along the way as well. Uh, I am going to wrap up with uh, a song that continues the hard theme of, uh, of this week's episode. Uh, there is none harder than Dying Fetus, uh, perhaps none harder than the t album title of their forthcoming record, Make Them Beg for Death. And I'm going to play a track called Feast of Ashes off of that. Whatever it is that you're doing, wherever it is that you are, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you bad motherfuckers again next week.